Remember, like back in the day when uh, if you were running late, you had to find a payphone? Before the internet was, well, everywhere. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah, wild. Well, today's deep dive is all about the organization that made today's hyper-connected world possible, the World Wide Web Foundation, or, you know, WWWF. The WWWF? You might not know the name offhand, but I bet you know the founder, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, sure. The guy who pretty much invented the World Wide Web. Right, right. Here's the interesting thing, though. They just announced they're closing down. Really? Yeah, and before you think, like, wait a minute, what's going to happen to the Internet? Yeah. It's actually a good news story. They're closing up shop because they achieved what they set out to do. Yep. So today we're going to take a deep dive into why the WWWF decided to close you know, what they actually accomplished while they were around and what it all means for, well, the future of the Internet. Okay. Okay, so get this back. When the WWF first got started, only about 20% of the world was actually online. Wow. I didn't realize it was that low. No. It's close to 70%. That's huge. Can you imagine that is a massive, massive leap? And that didn't just happen, you know, overnight. Right. So tell me, how did they do it? What kind of work went into making that happen? Well, what's really interesting is that the WWWF wasn't just about, you know, laying down cables and launching satellites. It was really about getting rid of the barriers that were in the way of people accessing the Internet. Like, I'm thinking about their work back in the late 90s, early 2000s in rural India. Back then, even landline phones, those were a luxury for a lot of people. And the Internet, forget it. But they partnered with these local NGOs and they set up Internet kiosks. Oh, interesting. And these weren't just random kiosks. They were community-owned. They provided affordable access to information, education, even business opportunities. Wow. They really understood that connectivity wasn't just about technology. It was about empowering people. It's one thing to read a statistic like 70% global Internet access. Yeah. But it's completely different to hear a story like that and to really like understand the human impact you know, of their work. Absolutely. And it wasn't just about getting more people online, right? They were also super involved in shaping Internet policy, especially when it comes to data privacy and online safety, stuff that I know we both think about a lot. All the time. What was their impact in those areas? It was huge, honestly. They were really instrumental in advocating for stronger data privacy regulations and like mm. globally. They understood that as our lives were moving more and more online, we needed to protect our digital footprints. Makes sense. And they weren't all talk either. They really worked with governments and policymakers to make those changes actually happen. Wow. They were total pioneers, really, in pushing for an Internet that put users first, mm -hmm. you know, where individuals had more control over their own data and their whole online experience. It's amazing to think that just one organization could have such a broad impact. Yeah. But then it makes you wonder... Why close down now? They were making so much progress. Well, you have to remember that from the very beginning, the WWF was laser focused on one thing, getting the world online. Hi. And with almost 70% of the world online now, they felt like, you know, mission accomplished. So it's like, okay, we did it. What's next? Yeah. And like the internet's not finished. Right? Exactly. What about all the new challenges that keep popping up? I mean, misinformation, cybersecurity, it seems like those are more pressing than ever. I mean, it's not like those problems just vanish because we hit some magic percentage of people online. Right? Well, not at all. You're right. Those are still very real problems. But the thing is, the whole landscape has changed. Now you've got all these organizations and they're specifically set up to tackle these new problems. Okay, so like who? Give me an example. Well, you've got groups like the Center for Countering Digital Hate. They're doing some really amazing work fighting misinformation online. Right. And then you've got groups like Access Now. They're leading the charge on pushing for, you know, better cybersecurity, more ethical AI development. So the WWWF, they were kind of like the trailblazers. Exactly. They laid the groundwork. They inspired a whole new generation of, you know, like digital defenders. So it's almost like their approach wasn't just about the things that they were doing themselves. It was about starting a movement. Yeah, yeah. They planted the seeds, and then they weren't afraid to step back and let others take the lead. Interesting. Speaking of stepping back, you know who's a great example of that? Their founder, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, right, right. He's moved on to other things, hasn't he? Yeah, he's now all about this new project, the Solid Protocol, which some people are saying is, like, the next step in his whole vision for the Internet. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is fascinating to me. 
I remember when I first heard about the solid protocol, it kind of felt like a direct response to, you know, all this stuff we've been talking about. Yeah. Data privacy, especially. Right. So remind us, for those who are just tuning in, what is the solid protocol? How does it connect back to what the WWWF is trying to do? So it definitely lines up with their whole vision of an open and fair Internet. That's for sure. Basically, the solid protocol, it's about giving you, the individual, more control over your data. Okay. Imagine if, instead of these big tech companies, you decided who got to see your information online and what they could use it for. It's kind of like the difference between owning your own home and renting, it's, right? Yeah. Like with the solid protocol, it's like you own the data, you get to set the rules. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's like we're all just wrenching our digital lives from these big tech companies. All right. right. And we have to play by their rules. Exactly. You said it better than I could. Mm. With Solid, instead of your data being like scattered everywhere, you know, across different platforms and servers, you have your own secure data store. Think of it like a digital lockbox that you control. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And you decide which apps, which services can see what parts of your data and what they can use it for. That would be amazing. But let's be real. How likely is it that we'll ever actually see this happen? I mean, yeah. the system we have now, as messed up as it is, it makes those big tech companies a ton of money. Right. Are they really going to give up that control? Yeah, that is the million dollar question, right? <laughs> the thing is, the solid protocol, it's not just about some new tech. It's about completely shifting how we think about power. For it to really work, people need to adopt it. Not just individuals, but developers too. And this is key, policymakers. So you're talking about changing the whole system, how we think about and use data online. Yes. Which is not going to be easy. It's a huge, huge undertaking. But here's the exciting part. It's already gaining some traction. There are developers out there building apps on the solid platform, and even some governments are starting to look at like what a more user-centric internet could look like. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the WWF may be closing up shop, but what they started is inspiring a lot of people. It's amazing to think that this organization, the WWWF, they started with this pretty simple mission, get the world connected, yeah. right? But they've had this huge impact on how we think about things like data and privacy. They really changed how we see the future of the digital world. They really have their influences undeniable. They weren't afraid to take on these big, complicated problems, and they always stuck to those core values. Which were? Openness, accessibility, and empowerment. Right. And that brings us to their legacy. Mm -hmm. And it's so much bigger than just the solid protocol, even bigger than just getting everyone online. Right. What do you think their most important contribution to the Internet is? What will people remember them for? You know, it really hits home that the Internet, it's not just some, like, thing out there, you know? Right. It's really a reflection of us, our values, like the kind of world we want to live in, you know? Exactly. Exactly. The Internet's a powerful tool. It can be used for so much good. But let's be honest, it can be used for some not-so-good things, too. Yeah. And the WWWF, they got that from the start. They were really dedicated to making sure that it was a force for good. And they weren't afraid to get in there and deal with some of those tough, complicated issues. Nope. Like, I'm thinking about all the work they did on online harassment, right? Yeah. Especially for women, marginalized communities. Absolutely. They didn't just, like, talk about it. They really pushed for platforms, policymakers to actually do something about it. Right. And that's so important. That's a huge part of their legacy, you know? They understood that real change, it takes more than just words. It takes action. It takes collaboration. It takes holding people accountable. Yeah. It's inspiring. They showed that even a small group can make a real difference. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they also recognize that there's only so much one group can do, right? Right. That's why they put so much energy into building this global network, advocates, researchers, everyday people who really cared about building a better internet. A hundred percent. They knew that to create real, lasting change, you need a movement, not just a moment. So where do we go from here? The WWF might be gone, but all those challenges, they haven't disappeared. What makes you hopeful for the future of the Internet, knowing how much work still needs to be done? You know, what gives me hope is people. People are incredibly resilient. We're resourceful. We're creative. The WWF might not be here to, you know, guy us anymore, but everything they did, it lives on in all the people and organizations fighting for an internet that's open, that's fair, and that's worthy of our trust. It's like they started the fire, and now it's up to all of us to keep it burning. Exactly. So as we wrap up our deep dive into the WWWF and the future of the internet, what's the one thing you want our listeners to take away from this? That the future of the internet, it's not set in stone. 
we get to decide what it looks like and we all have a part to play in that whether it's you know supporting organizations that are on the front lines thinking critically about the information we consume or even just talking to our friends and family about these things it can feel overwhelming for sure but you're saying that even small actions can have a big impact absolutely every single voice matters in this fight for a better digital world couldn't agree more and on that note a huge thank you to the WWWF for all the incredible work they did. Yeah. And to our listeners, keep asking those tough questions, keep pushing for better, and never underestimate the power of raising your voice. Until next time, keep diving deep.